and then use tone where necessary, clearly in the orbits of the eyes there's a lot of cast shadow. Don't have to put in every piece of cast shadow that there is, but if it seems to help the sensation of form, then put it in. Now's the time to accept a little bit of detail on the teeth, only to reinforce the, the nature of the arch. light just catching down here which is quite nice because it allows you to see the flatness of this zygomatic arch with its little edge so that it then turns into the orbit. And again the, the form turns away here, again a slight deviation from the, from the egg shape but not much. You can see we're still more or less on the same egg shape that we started with. But then you, you can find a few flats. There's a, sometimes there's a bit of a ridge along the, the top of the skull. And the, the, the dome there just slightly accented so it's not just the following the, the oval, the ovoid, I should say. Now, I'm just going to intensify a bit of tone here and here just to try and bring back the solidity of the overall form. We, what we don't want is a series of... We don't want it in the drawing of the skull and we don't want it in the drawing of a, of a human head. What we want is a, is a solid on which things are happening, not a lot of separate events. Most of the time, the side of the finger is enough to remove the charcoal that you don't want to create a light. If you find that you really need to get the light back, I don't think this is erasure, but rather just taking out lights. It's like painting with white. and try to get some solidity to this arch as well. It's turning away out of sight. And you need to put some darker tone in to reinforce the strength of, this, of these cheekbones. They're going to be very important when it comes to drawing the, the head. They're, there's hardly anything covering those. We talked about these two big muscles here. They do fill spaces, but across there, gently in, that will be filled with muscle, and that will be too. But all the rest of these areas are very close to the surface. You only just have to feel your own head and your, and your jaw and your cheekbone is there. The jaw, they're all very close to the surface. There's not very much covering them. So you're going to need to be conscious of them to remember this drawing of the skull that you did. Now to reinforce my point about the importance of the placing of the features as opposed to the detail of the features themselves, look at a, a picture of a famous person 
a face that everybody knows, uh, typically the background of a newspaper photograph, which is quite blurred, so that you can't actually see any detail of the eyes, the nose or the mouth. You can see where they are, but you can't tell what shape they are. And yet, you can recognise them easily. The only possible explanation for this is that those spaces, the spaces between the features, are just as important as the features themselves. Having accepted that we've got the features in the right place, now perhaps we should look at the features themselves in detail. Right, starting with the eye, we have a model here, but before starting drawing for the model, I'd like to remind you of the anatomy of the eye. Now, if you remember from the skull, there were two sockets into which the complete sphere of the eye nestles. Now, you're not going to be able to see this in life, but the point is that we see a small section of that sphere. And the fact that it is a sphere means that as the lids wrap over the section of the sphere and the iris and the pupil are revealed, usually just slightly cut by the upper lid, you feel the way that these follow the form. So that the white of the eye is not just a flat white shape. It's actually part of this whole sphere which is hidden and nestling within the orb. And it's, it's really essential to, to feel that going on. You'll, even the, the form underneath the eyes can tend to follow it and the brow above it will follow the ridge of the orbit. So let's try drawing a real eye now, or two eyes even. I'm not going to draw the whole orbit now because we know that it's there and as long as we're conscious of it, when you draw the... I'm going to start here with the lower lid because I can see the inner edge, the inner thickness of the lower lid. And that sweeps around following what... I can see very little of the white but I know that that's part of the sphere. The upper lid, because of the viewpoint that we have here, is almost disappearing from view under the brow. And here is the, the iris. Tear duct in the corner and out to the, to the orbit, which again from this view is quite close to the top of the eye. And the, here is the eyebrow that sits on the, on the top of the orbit. That's the furthest out part, uh, therefore protecting the eye. Don't make too much of the eyelashes. They're there, but they're not very dominant. Before really finishing that eye off, it's good to move across to the other one. And the line here, again due to my angle, is a downhill one. And although the nose impinges between, we have to sort of think about the distance between that tear duct and the other one. Now I say that that distance between that tear duct and the other one is just about as long as the length of the eye. That's, that's happening here because I'm seeing it. It's also something I half expected to be true, because it very often is. But it's not a rule, and you shouldn't rely on it. Now I can see even more I'm looking down into the thickness of the lower lid on the other eye. And I've got a, a better view of the top, just the outer edge of the top lid, and it does actually draw attention there to the, to the eyelash. Here goes the other iris and pupil. And very closely above it, the other eyebrow, refer back, yes, that's going all right. And then the nose.